God, we just come before you and lift up this tragedy of uh, whatever happened. I don't know any details other than, other than many lives were lost. So we pray for those families. We know that you will be glorified even in such a difficult and trying circumstance. We don't understand all of it, Lord, but we do know that things uh, allow, are allowed under your control. And so we just pray right now for those families. We pray for that whole situation. Pray for comfort and peace. We continually know and pray for your name to be magnified, even in the midst of lives being taken in this world that we live in. So God, I just ask right now, as we look in Philippians and Paul's encouragement to the people of Philippi, that we would be encouraged and have an understanding of the bigger picture, our true citizenship. And with that mindset and that understanding, that it would drastically change our lives in a radical way. Will you speak to each one of our hearts here this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 3, uh, they're going to try to follow along with me verse uh, by verse. If you want to open to verse 17 is where we'll start. For those of you who don't know, God allowed me in the privilege to live in countries of the Philippines and Belize at different points in my life. In fact, in the last six months, <laughs> this is amazing, at 38 years old, God allowed me in January to visit my closest, deepest friends in Belize. And then, four months later, this past April, I got to go to the Philippines, where I grew up as a child from 9 to 15 years old, and 20 years later, go back to see relationships and friends from a long time ago. And what a powerful and mighty thing that was. Because God, who is relational works in the same way in each one of our lives. Because he's relational and because he has designed us, we too have the ability and we love relationships. God has put that in us. And he's loved us so much that he's provided a way for each one of us to have a relationship with him. And so for me, that was an amazing thing as I, as I studied and prepared this week in the last six months that the seed was planted because of the opportunity to live outside of this amazing country that we call the United States of America. And so as I began to pray and God kind of impressed on my part, and I was going to actually share a couple Sundays ago, was this idea of being a citizen and how we can take it for granted and also that we don't completely sometimes understand that ultimately we are heavenly citizens. And if we understand that mindset, it should shape and navigate our lives in how we interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can say it's easier said than done, but I believe, as we read from Paul's words, that his encouragement and the way he lays it out should help us and guide us in the direction that we need to go. So if you want to open to Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Philippians is an amazing letter to believers. It's an amazing letter. Epistles are simply letters written to people, real people, by other real people. And so Paul from prison is writing this amazing letter to the people of Philippi in chains and totally encourage them in, in so many ways. Very many famous verses you'll find throughout Philippians. But if we look, look at the previous verses, I want to look at back at verse 13 where I want to start. He says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are wish ahead. If you're here this morning, my encouragement is to read that verse and chew on it. Maybe it's been a rough week. Maybe there's something that's dragging you down, a burden that is weighing you down. And you need to be encouraged to forget those things and to press forward. It's not always an easy thing to do, but Paul's encouragement 
previous to the verses that we're going to cover, is to forget the things in the past and press forward to this upward calling of the prize of running this race that God has allowed us to walk and live here on earth. And so after he's encouraged these verses, he picks it up now in verse 17. Look at the first word he's going to say to them. Brethren, you usually don't listen to people that are strangers. Let's be honest. The best way to get a, uh, someone's attention or to be able to have insight or give them godly counsel or advice is when you have a relationship. These people were near and dear to Paul's heart. And the first thing as he continues through that is brethren. It wasn't strangers down the road. It wasn't knock on your door and share tracks. It wasn't that mindset. It was people that he really genuinely loved and refers to them as brethren. Obviously brothers and sisters, but brethren, look what he says, join in following my example. That's pretty bold. In fact, he said, well, what a show off. I don't think very many of us would want to get up here and say, hey, everyone, follow my example, follow my lead, because all we have to do is say, let's talk to your wife, Travis, to find out who you really like. And very soon, whoa. But he sees the bigger picture. We're setting examples whether you know it or not. Just by you coming on a Sunday morning. And whether or not you're sitting here, maybe you're just sleeping through the whole service, or maybe you're here and it's, you're not really even paying attention, you're on your iPhone or whatever. The bottom line is, you've made it a priority to be here, and people see that, and they know that on Sunday mornings, maybe on Wednesday nights, that this person has put God in a little maybe higher priority than other things in their lives. And that actually goes a long ways, believe it or not. So we are examples, whether we realize or not, but how much more if we have the right understanding and our desire is to press on after the Lord and to have the boldness in a humble heart to say, follow me as I follow the Lord. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 11, 1, sorry, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. If you want to just flip a few books over. In chapter 10, as Paul also is the author of this book written to the church of Corinth, in chapter 10, verse 32, look, look what it says. He says, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks, or look at what it says, to the church of God. Interesting, the three categories, which Pastor Rick is very big on, in which this idea, Jews, Gentiles, or Greeks is what he uses here, and to the church of God. Look what it says. Just as I also please men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that what? That they may be saved. It's not about his profit, his comfortability. It's about others. And look what's on the heels of this verse, chapter 11. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Woo! Now imagine raising your hand in the services you're going to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That sounds very prideful and bold, but it's really not. Because that's God's desire. He's called you. He's called out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Imperfect people need other imperfect people to follow as an example. But if you have the right foundation and you've been understanding God's word, you know that we're simply human. It's only by God's spirit working in our lives and us heeding to God's spirit allowing God's spirit to move and as we walk that Paul could say hey follow me as imperfect as I am as I follow the Lord I think we should tune into that you may say well I got a lot of work to do and I say yes you do so do I <laughs> I'll agree with you I don't have it all I don't have it figured out I can't teach the script I don't understand it either but you know what it's much bigger than that God gives you the desire when people know you in a relationship the prayer is that they see the real you. That there will be something in you that they are drawn to. That's what's the bigger picture. There's something in you that even when you get angry at work or you offend them, that you're willing to ask for forgiveness. That you're willing to say, I messed up. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what's going to draw people in to say, wow, what an example to follow. That's powerful. And so Paul flipped back to verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example. And look what it says. And note. If you're here this morning or you're going wherever, take note of other people that you see in your life 
that are setting examples. Don't put them on this crazy pedestal, please. Don't ever do that. Recognize they're humans, but there are people like a relationship with Paul to Timothy where they're a blessing to one another. Take note of those that are leading by example that are setting for us a pattern. They're setting up, for Paul's example here, Timothy and Epaphroditus were great godly men examples that you see throughout. We need to show other people how an imperfect person navigates through this world with the correct mindset of pressing towards the goal. And we're all looking. We all want to be friends, I would hope, and have relationships with those that would encourage us that kind of, you know, um, iron sharpens iron and helps us to grow in our walk, in our sanctification to become more like Christ. Does everyone understand that? So that's Paul's encouragement here in the verse, uh, main verse. And that's isn't even the main topic that I'm going to get to. So <laughs> bear with me. Verse 18. Here's the downside. Here's the positive, now the downside. For many walk of whom I have told you often. Paul continually warns believers, just like Pastor Rick and as, as leaders of the church, elders, us, continually warn to be on the, the uh, cautious side for false teachers. Those that are not teaching the scripture the way God had intended. And look what he says. Many of you, I have told you often and I now tell you even weeping. You don't cry for the interest of somebody unless there is a genuine love and concern for that person automatically you become emotional. And I can relate, trust me. There are near and dear brothers and sisters that are going through difficult times or maybe have completely just said, I don't care about the Lord anymore. Yeah, I know I went and I, you know, and I felt God's, but I don't feel it's real anymore. It breaks your heart because you genuinely care for them and where they're at. And the road maybe they're traveling down knowing that they need to just make a slight turn and allow God and surrender in their lives. It breaks your heart and it brings you to tears. That's how Paul was relating to. That was what he's saying here. I've told you many times, and you can find it in Acts, constantly he's warning about people creeping in church, twisting their word of God or creating problems, uh, disunity. God won't have that and Paul's expressing that. And he says, even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Three things that he identifies here as these enemies of the cross of Christ. One is, well, whose end is their destruction, right? But whose God is their belly. Their God is their stomach. Well, what does that mean? Their own physical desires. It could also mean their fleshly accomplishments. I do this, this, and that. Or in other words earning favors in this particular instance, what it seems like, in dietary laws. Throughout humanity, and even us today, we like to do things to impress other people on the physical outside appearance. I go to church this many times a day, I give this amount of money, it's, it's all these things that are visual that we can see. And in, in fact, in God, in the Old Testament, many times you come to me, you prepare these sacrifices or whatever, it was very outward. And it's appealing to our natural nature. Because nobody really sees our heart. And on the outside, we can look really good, like a, a nice whitewashed you know, tomb or a fence, but the inside, we're decayed and we're dying. But it's easy to fool others. You can't fool, the, fool God. He wants what's inside of you. Because out of the heart proceeds through your mouth, right? That's how it's revealed. So the first thing, their God is their stomach, their own physical, keeping these things. Second, their glory is their shame. They heaped up praises upon themselves. They loved it when other people would praise them. That was their glory. You know? That was their glory. If they want to be seen and they want to pray on the corners or look how much I give or whatever, guess what? That is your reward. <laughs> it's no longer a heavenly reward. That's why it says not to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. In other words, nobody really should know. You know? But their desire was like, well, everyone should know because they'll elevate me to another level. Their glory is their shame. The Bible can teaches the complete opposite. The Bible says, hey, 
That is your reward. Everyone recognizing you and think, wow, you're a good guy. You donated this, you did this. That's your reward. It's no longer eternal. How much more better is our eternal rewards that we're storing up in heaven as we help brothers and sisters move in the church? As God lays on your heart to be a blessing to someone else that nobody knows about. My wife has been blessed so many times by people we don't even know. When we were serving in Belize and just people blessing in our apartment that we're in now and so forth. We don't even know. We don't need to know. That's between the person and the Lord. That's how God works. That's powerful. So their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. Who set, the third thing, their mind on earthly things. They set their mind on earthly things. We're going to hit this as we get into citizenship, but also I'll try not to go too far into this. We have to take care of earthly things. We have to pay our bills. We do need a vehicle to get back and forth to work. We do have jobs. We do want to you know, have a home to live in and so forth. But the idea here is that these earthly things are to gain God's favor. So they've twisted it. They're finding these different things to earn God's favor depending on the physical. That's not the case. Physical observances. Well, I do this, this, and this. Any attempt to bring um, favor to God is what they were doing here. Once again, outward, in the physical realm, not the spiritual, because God's word teaches the complete opposite. Right? It's all about the inward, what God's doing in your heart, which will extend by your works and be rev and it will be revealed. Now, sometimes our fruit's not very good, I'll be honest with you. That's okay. Pick those fruit off, right? But God will be the one to fix your heart. That's the root. That's where it starts at. And everything flows out from that in our lives, in how we interact, in how we serve, and how we see our position with the Lord. And so those three things he just wanted to clarify about these people that have snuck in. They were enemies of the cross. Their gods are stomach. Their glories are shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Now what you do when you're writing a letter, when you set out these things, guess what? It's all going to be evidenced by basically wickedness. And so if you're receiving this letter, they could actually, hmm, look at this and look around our church as leaders and say, hmm, who fits this category? It's important for us to be warned and know the truth. And God does that very clearly throughout God's word. There's no surprises with God. You notice that? He's very clear. It's either black and white. He lays it out clearly and he says, okay, now you get to walk and navigate your life. And however you want to do, I will not force you. And so he lays it out very clearly. These are the identifying factors or characteristics of those that are enemies of the cross. Be on guard. Watch for that. Now, if you make this statement, and because Paul is gifted by the Lord and a writer, how do you kind of summarize what each one of us live in and the things maybe you're dealing with in your life right now? Look at verse 20. What was his encouragement to fix this problem of living for the desires of the earth and the wrong perspective? Verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. I googled citizenship. You know, that's what nowadays information is like that. You know, anything you want, it's at your fingertips. Anyone, anyone ever said you want to impress your friends in about 10 minutes? You go study up on some sub-nuclear atomic bomb and you'll notice, okay, is this? And you, hey, buddy, well, this is what it's about. We can do that nowadays on our finger trips because of Google. So I simply put in, what does citizenship mean? And Googled it. This is what it says, the citizenship. Citizenship is gained by meeting the legal requirements of a national, state, or local government. A nation grants certain rights and privileges to its citizens. In return, citizens are expected to obey their country's laws and defend it against its enemies. Wow. That's in the physical sense. Now, is there many, much application in a spiritual sense? Oh, man, you're not kidding. We're heavenly citizens. Did you know... To become a U.S. citizen, and I might be stepping in because this is a hot topic and issue around the world. It's really not if you get down to, if you're a believer, I hope you recognize this morning, 
that you're a heavenly citizen, and then secondly, you're an American citizen. If you got those backwards, you're going to have a rough time living here on earth. And I can almost guarantee if you come up here and you're getting upset or all these things going around, there's probably a misunderstanding that you're first a heavenly citizen and a U.S. citizen. Don't get them confused or you're going to have a tough time navigating and living, especially in our country of the United States. So I'm hoping this will encourage you. To be a U.S. citizen, obviously the easy way is you're either born as in the U.S. or your parents, one or the other. But if you're not to become a U.S. citizen, this again, I just Googled it, you apply in a process. There's a process to become a citizen. You take a naturalization test, which consists of English and civics. And I think everyone knows it. So that's kind of, as I Google it, that's for a U.S. citizen. Now I was kind of curious, how about to be a Philippine citizen? It says, same thing for being born or your parents, but you not, if not, you must be 21 years old. You must live in the Philippines for 10 continuous years. You must have real estate, land. You must have a lucrative job. It actually says lucrative job. And speak English or Spanish or one of their languages, and you pay around $1,000 to be a citizenship. All right? Interesting, isn't it? Each country sets their own requirements to become a citizen of that country. What is the citizenship requirements of a heavenly citizen? Man. Well, you can find it all through. You can look at verses John 3, 16. Or, but the bottom line is, this is a recognition that you're a sinner. You have nothing to offer God. Romans Road, you can read all these verses. And a simple surrender. And what it says in John 3, 3, you must be born again. Born from above, a regeneration of your spirit, not the physical. Not like Nicodemus got confused. Oh, I'm going to climb into my mother's womb and come out again. No, that's not the new birth that I'm talking about. It's this new birth, right? Born from above. And then if you read John 14, 6, which nobody likes to read at funerals, including the one this past week. John 14, 6 says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I wish that verse was read more than God love, for God so loved the world. Those are the requirements of a heavenly sin. In other words, a recognition that there is a creator. He wants to have a relationship with me. My life's a complete mess. There's no way I can earn or work or do this or give this amount of money to earn his favor. He simply offers it to me and I just stand there and I receive it. And he's my savior. But the Bible also teaches that he's your savior and he's your Lord. So now all of a sudden he's my savior, but he's also my Lord. He's bought me at a price. He's bought me at a price. He is my master. So therefore, my rights, my privileges belong to him and him alone. He is the king and I am going to navigate my life through his spirit working in me, knowing that I'm not perfect, but knowing God's spirit will convict my heart and I can have either choose to obey or disobey. And he loves me as a child of God and not as a child of wrath. And so therefore, Travis is disciplined as a child of God. Has nothing to do, he's going to hell or whatever. No, it's because he loves me just like I spank my son because he loves me. I ground him for whatever. The same thing God does with me when I get out of line. That's what we have here this morning if we have this relationship with the Lord. So, I have a friend at work. Uh, in fact, uh, my buddy that's going to, uh, that kind of spurred me into, you know, maybe helping him learn Spanish. The other day on Friday or Wednesday when I was preparing for this message and thinking, I said, I want to ask him a question. Why do you want to become a U.S. citizen? Because the, way, the relationship that we built at work is, he says, I want you to ask me questions about U.S. government and civics to help me pass my, my test to become a citizen. So you know me, I know a lot. So he didn't know I knew so much information about, you know, all the, you know, stuff, senators and Congress. And so we always go back and forth. And then he tries to give me some Mexican history. And so that's helping me. And so... On Wednesday, I said, I want you to think about this. I don't want to answer right away. I want you to ask you, why do you want to become a U.S. citizen? And he says, okay. So I don't know. It might have been an hour and a half later. He comes up and he says, two things. And I, I wrote them down here. He says, one, because my family is here and I want to be with them. Interesting. Even these kind of spiritual things too. Kind of, My family is here and I want to be with them. And secondly, I like the rules and the system of government here, the freedom. Those are the two things that I gave him time to chew on. 
Interesting, isn't it? His family's here. He wants to be with his family. He wants to be a citizen. And also, he likes the way the rules, the system of government are set up here. And he lo I, just, I just love it here. Man. Citizen. That's his reasoning on the physical. How much on the spiritual? How much do we not realize what we have spiritually as heavenly citizens? Many people, for you guys that don't know, because... I've lived in Belize, I've had the opportunity, and I've been to Mexico, or whatever. Many people want to come to this amazing country, and I can't blame them at all. Liz and I, man, we come back, we love it here. The blessings, the, just everything, all the things that he laid out. We love it. So there's also millions of other people that want to come here. But guess what? Some people come here illegally. They come as what we call an illegal alien. Right? And they come here for whatever reason they seek for us. Now, I want you to put yourself, think of spiritual and the physical as I go through this list. If I am coming from another country and I'm now here in the U.S., what's the first thing you recognize when you sneak across a border or you're here illegally? What are you naturally going to do? Well, first of all, I'm going to recognize that I don't belong here. And because I don't belong here is going to dictate the way that I'm going to interact with the people in this country. Start thinking spiritual too. All right? So now here I'm illegally. I'm living in Mesquite. I shouldn't be here. I'm always going to be what? The next thing? Alert. Because I am illegal. I don't belong here. This is not my home. My mindset, my perspective changed drastically. Because I know this is temporary. This isn't where I belong. Interesting. You're always alert. You're cautious wherever you go. Basically, we call it looking for ice. But how about in the spiritual sense? If you have the right mindset, you're in a foreign home, you're watching for Satan to do what? To catch you. To trip you up. To point his finger at you. To convict you. To throw you away into a jail. When I began to think about this, I said, this is amazing. In the physical sense also applies if we as believers recognize that we're here on this earth as illegal aliens, we should live the same way and not get comfortable, not get tent, not get bogged down with what's going on here on this earth. But to have the right mindset, cautious, alert, watching for the enemy, realizing this is temporary, my home, my car, seeing the bigger picture of who I'm living for. And then for, and the, kind of the third thing that I kind of thought about was, it kind of goes along, can never get comfortable no matter where they are because they know it's temporary and they must be ready to move at any minute. A mission mindset. The time when you get comfortable and you say, this is where I'm going to live and die, this is where I'm going to serve the Lord, watch out. God may want to move you elsewhere. Have the right mindset wherever God sends you. Maybe right now you're wrestling with something that God wants to move you to another town or you're praying about another job opportunity. Have the correct mindset as you go before the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know. Yeah, I have this option or whatever. The correct mindset in understanding that it's temporary and how you live here will dictate the way you respond and interact. In other words, you never get content because you realize that you are an illegal alien living here in the cosmos. Because who put you there? God. And that right there should change our whole perspective and realize that we are a created being, not by chance, which is the world is telling you. Re realizing that God wants to have a relationship with you. The world says, no, you've got to earn that relationship. I can go list on and on of the complete contraries of what the Bible teaches and the world. And God allows you to be here and to choose. It's powerful. So, in summary, this is a lot on citizenship, <laughs> but it's good, I hope. You're kind of following my mindset here. We have to understand that we are followers of Christ first, then we're American citizens, but living in this amazing country, our allegiance has to be to who? Our King, Christ, who is in heaven. If we understand that, not completely, understand that concept, we allow God's Spirit to move it should change our whole lives. Seriously. 
If you start having this mindset this morning, you walk out of here and you realize this is not your home, that yeah, I'm an American, it's great and all, but I don't want to get comfortable here. I want to have the correct perspective. I guarantee it's going to drastically change your lives and it's going to make you uncomfortable. But that's a good thing. It's good to be uncomfortable. In fact, every time you read God's word, you better be uncomfortable. Amen. Unless you got it all figured out. <laughs> but there's always areas that need adjustment that God wants to continue to work in. One last thing. I'm not done on this citizenship. <laughs> Another story. Until you, and here's the other thing about being a heavenly a citizen. Until you travel to other, other countries, for the most part, you won't appreciate your U.S. citizenship. Amen. And these four young girls that are coming back from Belize, I can't wait to hear it. And I guarantee most of their story is going to be, I can't believe how lucky I am. We went to this house with a dirt floor, a thatch roof. They have hardly any food. They, weren't, they didn't have video games. They didn't have an iPad. They didn't have any of this. They were entertained just by kicking a little soccer ball back and forth for hours on end. And they just want to do these crafts and they enjoyed it. Nobody complained. We have to realize what we have. And you don't appreciate it until you're taken out of it. And my prayer, and that's why I'm very big on giving opportunities, especially for youth, to get out of the box and have an opportunity to do this. It will grow your relationship. Here's a couple, uh, one thing. Uh, when we, I don't want to share this story, but I do. Um, because sometimes uh, the world, we went to the airport and we arrived in Cebu in the Philippines. And because we're Americans, you just think everything's going to work. Nothing's going to break down, right? And so we get in the ba baggage carousel, begins to come up with like six pieces of luggage. And all of a sudden it stops. Keep in mind, it's pretty humid already. You got, how many people are on the plane? I don't know, a couple hundred. And everyone's gathered around waiting to get their luggage. It's 4.30 in the morning, so you've been flying all night. You're a zombie, right? And all of a sudden, the baggage carousel stops. Well, because I've lived in other countries, it's not a big deal. You expect it. It's all right. No big deal. You know, I've, we've had power go off for, you know, hours on end. So you just say, what are you going to do? Complain? Yeah, be miserable? Yeah, or just sit there and talk, well... Here we are, honey, you know, and just try to have a good attitude. Well, there was this an American man. He's about 6'3", maybe mid-50s. And I'm not even paying attention. There's, he's over on the next carousel. He lifts up the black rubber thing and says, Come on, get it going. What's going on back there? <laughs> this is no joke. My blood began to boil very quickly. And his Filipino wife was like ashamed because this is an honor and shame culture. You don't like to lose face. You don't want to do things like that. And all these Filipinos, they, they all like, what's going to happen with this big white American guy? He's going to lose it. That this, And it became very awkward. And there was only a few Americans, uh, my wife and I, maybe a couple more than him. And his wife, married to him, was just, you could just see, and I just, my heart broke for her. And all of a sudden, what's going on? He, you know, and I was, uh, you know, my Christian side wanted to be set aside. I wanted to say, dude. Really, you know, whatever. Just, you know, say, dude, relax, okay? It's, it's going to it's gonna get fixed or whatever. But I didn't, praise God. I just, yeah, I just stand on the other side. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the worker from Philippine Airlines comes walking over, and you could see him shaking. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know the whole conversation, but they ended up switching it to another carousel. Sad to say, a lot of times, that's what most countries see us as. And you, and you know what? I, can't, I couldn't blame the guy because he's been, what, trained? in our country, and if you've never spent other times, you take things for granted, and you just expect everything to work, the air conditioning, the food to be perfect, everything to be lined up. Otherwise, any little misstep or whatever, we get uncomfortable. Appreciate your citizenship here, but how much more even our heavenly citizenship, that the riches and to understand that it's so much more perfect with streets of gold and being in God's presence. But here we are, things are not always going to go your way. The people that you love in your life, they may not get saved. They may die separated from God's presence. That's not easy to handle. Another thing, driving and obeying laws. The first thing when we got in the car, I, I forgot how much. Nobody obeys the lines in the road and the rules. You use your horn. That's how you communicate. Beep, beep. You and nobody pulls out from you. And so we get into the city of like almost 2 million people, and we're driving around, and it's complete chaos at 5 o'clock in the morning or whenever it was, 5.30 by the time we came into the airport. And for me, I was like, I forgot how bad driving was. <laughs> 
And I even said when I went there, I told Liz, I said, I'm not going to drive here. We'll take taxis because it's very cheap. And I'm so glad. There's no way I could have survived driving in that. I would have been, I wouldn't have went anywhere because I would be bold enough to honk and look him in the eye and keep driving. I would be like, you know, I'm the white American. I don't want the ticket to get, you know, picked on or whatever. What else? Poverty. Let's be honest. I, you can go to, you know, I, it was in Phoenix and the areas where a lot of refugees, they put them in these apartment complexes that were really bad situations in Phoenix. And I saw the worst of the Phoenix. It's nothing compared to what these people are living to, living in countries around the world. Poverty is much different. Even though as bad as here, it's like this level. The poverty. We don't, we don't, until we see it and grasp it, that it's just a zinc piece of wood and some sh things that's on the side and there's no running water and they just use a bathroom and a bucket or whatever. We just, our, our minds, until we see it, we can't grasp it. But it's a good thing. It's good for us because then we should remember and appreciate. And then the uh, last thing I could go on and on is the language. Nobody really spoke a lot of English. We think they should. We think the shine should be, in no. You're living in another country. You're a heavenly citizen on the, in the spiritual side. You're living in another country here on this earth. Why should things be the way that you think they should be if you don't have the right, correct perspective, a heavenly one? You're going to be miserable. You're going to have a difficult time. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be frustrated with other people. My prayer is that God, you'd be open to allow Him to change you and that this mindset would be heavenly and that as you spend more time in God's Word, that's the only way you're going to get to know more about God's kingdom. Fellowshipping with one another, being a part of Wednesday nights or whatever the church offers or other churches offer, hearing God's teaching, spending time on your own, allowing God's spirit to work. Heavenly citizen benefits are only described to us. Think about it. We really don't know our heavenly benefits. We know right now we have God's grace and riches at, our, at Christ's expense. But we have no idea other than what we read in Revelation and other parts of Scripture talking about what it's like when we leave this physical earth and we have these new bodies which we'll quickly cover. We just, we don't know it at all. Remember, the people that he's writing to in Philippi, they were colonists. They were really from the city of Rome. You notice the word citizen isn't countrymen? Originally, most people, it was a representation of their city. So the word kind of, this is this citizen rather than a countryman. And so they were, yes, yeah, they were residents registered, right? In basically the book of life in Rome, but they were living where? In Philippi. Your name, if you're a believer, is registered in the book of life in heaven, but where are you living? Here. But you're registered in the kingdom of God. You know that this isn't your permanent place. This is temporary. It's powerful. If we really take that in, take a state, step back, and now as we analyze things going on in our life, whatever it is, the financial, the relationships or whatever, and we begin to gauge things and see it with the mindset of this, it should change your perspective. That when we're uncomfortable and it's hot, like when this team comes back, I know they're going to say how hot it was and miserable, my wife can attest, but you stick through it, you push through it, and ultimately, they knew they were coming back to the air conditioning. <laughs> well, same thing with heaven. We know if we push through it, we live here on the earth, but there is joy that the end is uh, going to be much better. Realizing that you're citizens of heaven, live like an illegal alien here on earth, and your mindset will be correct. Think about that. Realize that we're citizens of heaven, and to live your life in the spiritual sense that you are an illegal alien here on this earth. I guarantee you, if you really chew on that throughout the day and tomorrow in the week and see that, it should have an impact. It should dictate on how you navigate your life moving forward. Now quickly, let's wrap up these last few verses um, in which ties it all there. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly wait for the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, look verse 21, who will, this word is all throughout scripture, transform our lowly bodies. I'm not an English guy, you know, um, language guy, but metasmatique, I think that's how you say it, is like the Greek, coming from basically a new design. You can also, it has the idea of an architect. We're going to have a new design body. 
Just like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, as you guys know his appearings <laughs> to disciples and after. These, are, these bodies, don't get used to them, folks. <laughs> these are just temporary. These are our earthly suits as we live here on earth that get old, that get diseased, <laughs> that have uh, gone through physical ailments right now, the people in our church, shingles, cancer. It's temporary. We're going to have these new bodies. And it's going to be exciting. Can I tell you exactly how it all fits? No, I can't. And I won't even try to explain it all. But we have hope. Who will transform our lowly body that may be what? Conformed to his glorious body. According to what? By working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It's under his absolute control. And he's going to arrange it back to his original intent. Because he is God. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Almighty. It's powerful. We should take hope in that as we navigate and live in our lives. Now, I'm sure many of us have heard these verses, so I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just challenging and giving you something that I've wrestled with for the past week and the past few trips that I've taken. But if we don't grasp it, it's not going to play in our lives. If we can't find a practical way to apply it, because Paul is a great teacher, he said, okay, what's the best way to get in this mindset of these people of Philippi to understand all the things that I've talked about for the first three chapters and kind of summarize, he basically lands on what? Your citizenship is in heaven not here on her. So why are you getting bogged down, disappointed, hurt by relationships, whatever's going on in your life that's feeling you depressed or not where you want to be, you have the wrong mindset. Your mindset better be that you're a heavenly citizen. And when you understand it, and you allow God and say, Lord, I want to really grasp that idea. Yeah, I'm a believer. I, I have a relationship with you. I want to set whatever's, the, forget the things that are in the past and moving forward. That's the mindset that I want to have. Empower me. Place people in my lives that can help and encourage me as I move forward in my walk with you. In the last verse, which goes into 4.1, I don't like the way they broke this down, but that's okay. Therefore, with everything that I've just said, my beloved and long for brethren. Once again, the relationship is so clear. You guys have relatives that don't leave, live here, and you maybe haven't seen you, and you long for them. They're beloved. They're near and dear to your heart. You care with them so much that if you got a call right now, you don't have the money, you would use your credit card and fly out to encourage them and to see them because that's how important they are to you. That was this group in Philippi that Paul was writing to. And each one of us here had the same kind of relationships in our lives, or maybe it was that and now it's broken and we're trying to find the ways to reconnect or reconcile. Do it. Pursue it. Pray about it. It was important to Paul. It better be important to us because he set an example. He's setting a pattern. And then the last thing, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. That's a military term. Stand fast at your post. Don't back down. Don't retreat. Stand fast. You're in a battle. Stand fast. Your position. Hold your ground. And if you're getting weak, you're thinking about falling, or maybe you want to back down, then get one of the other soldiers, one of us other believers, and ask for prayer. Ask for someone to come along and say, this is what I'm struggling with, and we can pray for you. In fact, after when we close the song of worship, a few of us elders will be here, and we'd love to pray for you. Please, don't take, or take advantage of it. Don't take it for granted. We want to pray and stand fast with you if you're finding yourself weak or falling backwards. And here's my closing thought, just to challenge us as we go to the Lord in prayer and as the worship team comes up. Don't get comfortable with your temporary home here on earth. Live your life with the proper understanding of an illegal alien here on this earth 
And if you grasp that, and you understand that it's only God's spirit that can do this, the result is you're going to live a life that's pleasing to the king of heaven, not to the king of the United States or any other leader. Does everyone understand that? So as we leave here this morning and as you head into a new week or you would like prayer from one of the elders or leaders up here, we'd love to pray for you. Uh, that's just simple encouragement that I want to encourage you with this morning in a recognition of your true citizenship as you continue to go out these doors into the mission field and love on other people. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for your word. Uh, thank you for this whole idea of citizenship. Help each one of us, Lord, if we're here this morning and we have a relationship with you to get a hold of this. Maybe this past week, things are just overwhelming us. It's just a heavy burden. And we don't have the correct perspective. We're living for the now, in the next few weeks, rather than with the eternal perspective. That this is not our home, that we're illegal aliens passing through in our mindset, in our understanding, because of the work of your Spirit, will help us along this journey. Help us to reach out to others that are struggling. Help us to have boldness and to be open and transparent whatever those things are going on that are weighing us down. We want to love and encourage and lift up one another here this morning and moving forward as a body of Christ. Give us this correct perspective that we see here in scriptures. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.